right, so uh, I'm, of course, Brian Palmer. I'm an assistant professor here, for those who don't know me, um, in computer science, and I have the honor of introducing our speaker today um, for our distinguished uh, seminar series. Um, so today we actually have uh, Lana Lezevnik. Um, she received her PhD in computer science at uh, University of Illinois in 2006. And um, after she was an assistant professor for a bit at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. She actually returned to be a faculty at UIUC, um, where she's currently a full professor in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, she's received a lot of awards, including uh, NSF Career Award, Microsoft Research Faculty Fellow, a Sloan Research Fellowship, and also an IEEE Fellow. Uh, her 2006 paper on spatial pyramid matching uh, actually received uh, basically a Test of Time Award for a significant impact in computer vision. Um, and she's also served as the program chair for a number of uh, top conferences in computer vision like um, uh, ECCV, ICCV, and CVPR. Uh, she's currently the editor-in-chief of the International Journal in Computer Vision. Um, and she's gonna talk here about uh, some of her, her recent research. And thanks. Thank you, Brian. Um, this is my first visit to BU, and it's a real honor, you know, to be <laughs> hosted by my former student. Definitely a first. I couldn't be prouder or more pleased. Um, so I will talk today about some work um, in generative models by some of my current students. But first, you know, by way of an introduction, it just it provides some context. So this is my old person rant. Um, and of course, you know, Simpsons memes are probably also dating me as an old person. That's okay. <laughs> All right. So I used to think of myself as a recognition person. That's what I would always say. My main research focus is, you know, um, recognition, um, image understanding, this sort of thing. But I don't even know what that means anymore. I don't know what recognition means or whether it's dead or alive. Uh, these are just a couple of snapshots or of a couple of benchmarks. Of course, classification on ImageNet is long dead. Um, even harder tasks like instance segmentation, even as of maybe 2015, 2016, I would bring up instance segmentation as something that is a pretty hard image understanding task. Well, you know, it's all saturated. We can do it. We don't really care about it anymore. So recognition, um, you know, I don't really do it. Um, images and text is something I used to do for a while, maybe around 10 years ago. Um, so Brian, of course, you know, this first picture is kind of a picture from the work of Brian's lab mate. I'm sure that Brian remembers it. Um, so these were the good old days of image text embeddings. Um, we, together with Li Wei and Brian and others, you know, designed some of these very early image text embeddings. We trained them on maybe like 30,000 image text pairs. You know, it was nice. Uh, it was sort of all very cozy. Um, but then, of course, Clip came along in 2021. You know, similar kind of image text embedding, slightly different objective function. Is it better or worse than what we did? I'm not entirely sure, but it was trained on millions of image text pairs on a scale that we couldn't even dream of. So by that point, I was not really doing image text embeddings anymore. Um, well, and of course, today we have GPT-4V. I think it was Alyosha Efres who say, said at last CVPR, by the time this model comes out, 80% of papers published at CVPR will be obsolete. Um, maybe he was not completely wrong. Maybe it's not 80%, but there is some non-trivial percentage of papers that probably became obsolete. So I kind of ask myself when we have such behemoths like GPT-4V, what does image text research even mean? Um, so maybe Brian can tell me later. I know he and lots of other people still do active research in it. But for me personally, just my own opinion, it's not fun anymore. So I hope you can try to convince me otherwise because I'm pretty down on it. So yeah, images and text, not for me anymore. Um, well, generative modeling, in general, image generation is something that I always thought was really cool. Um, I was always, back in my recognition days, I was always too intimidated to do it because things didn't work well. It was not clear how to evaluate it. 
But then, of course, neural networks, you know, got a hold of image generation just like everything else. You know, I really like this tweet from Ian Goodfellow. It's already five years old, but it's still a great summary of the first five years of GANs. So they solved face generation. Um, you know, even at that point when generated faces were starting to look pretty good, I could still tell myself, you know, together with my colleagues, well, this problem is still way harder than generating faces. Faces have a very fixed structure. There's a very sort of limited, um, you know, variability, degrees of freedom of the space manifold. So with enough data, it's not all that surprising. These models are starting to do well, but how about a much harder um, category that's much more deformable, much more variable, you know, something like dogs with articulated bodies. There's a lot much larger variation of backgrounds, attributes. Um, surely we need some breakthrough. We don't know what the right models are going to be. Maybe we need this compositionality. People used to talk a lot about this mythic compositionality that you need to have in your models to generate complex objects um, with deformability, with a part structure, with lots of different attributes, or scenes that have you know, different attributes, different objects that interact in different ways. Surely we need something like compositionality, some simple naive neural network is not gonna be enough. Um, and I like to show this because I wrote a proposal with some colleagues in 2017, basically making this argument and saying, okay, this problem is still going to not be solved for many, many years, give us some money, we will think about it. They gave us some money, but it turned out that they didn't need to give us any money because guess what? Even next year, GAN generated dogs started looking way better without any breakthroughs apart from just scaling up the size of the GAN and scaling up the data a bit. Um, and that, of course, was not the end of the story because then another couple of years later, we had diffusion models. And these are the kinds of things that honestly, I, I still do not believe that they produce results that they do. I mean, obviously I believe that they do because <laughs> they exist and so on and we can run them, but I cannot explain intellectually how this is possible. How, you know, these diffusion models like DALI 3, stable diffusion, mid-journey, all of these things, um, how they can produce, you know, a picture of Salvador DALI with a robotic half face and, you know, penguins and Christmas sweaters playing hockey on Mars and whatever it is that people dream up. So, you know, surely we would have thought without compositionality, without some new class of models whose mathematical structure we're not yet smart enough to figure out, there's no way that we can generate such complex scenes. Once again, turned out um, not the case at all. All we need is to scale up models that are flexible enough. You know, diffusion models by themselves are some interesting things about them mathematically. So one could ask, okay, is it really the diffusion models? But then again, we have autoregressive models that are based on totally different principles, can do roughly as well. So I think the argument is pretty strong that it's all really about the scale of the model and scale of the data. Anyway, um, and of course, you know, things are not done uh, improving, so we really don't know is this process going to saturate soon or, um, you know, how is it going to progress. It, yes? Um, well, I'm not sure in what form, maybe in some very indirect form, maybe we can come back to it at the end because I don't want to sort of derail my talk right from the start. Um, but we'll see, you know, I do have a rant at the end that is kind of optional um, that, you know, maybe if people want to stay later or whatever, or if I just rush through the technical parts very quickly, we can come back to the rant and we can, um, you know, talk ab about these kind of questions. Okay. But in the meantime, um, so what is my current takeaway? Well, image generation is really cool. I find it fascinating. Once again, I cannot explain how these models work as well as they do. Um, 
so these days, if you look at the kinds of papers that my students and I are writing, they mainly tend to be about various aspects of these generative models. Um, but for how long are we gonna be able to keep doing it? I have no idea. Um, and what can we do with these models, which is feasible for academics is actually quite limited, but you know, we hustle the best we can. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects from my current senior students, Ayu Kui and Viraj Shah. Um, so Ayu has been working on virtual try-on. So I'll talk about a couple of her works. And Viraj has been uh, working on adaptation of diffusion models. And I'll talk about his very recent project. Okay, so starting with virtual try-on. Well, what is virtual try-on? Um, this is a screenshot from the webpage of a startup from Illinois called Reverie.ai. It's actually a couple of PhD students of David Forsyth, my colleague, who are behind it. I'm not involved with it at all, so it's a completely gratuitous plug for them. Um, so many of you maybe already have come across this kind of technology, but the idea is shown here pretty well. Basically, you have a picture of a model or maybe ultimately your own picture and you have some pictures of garments you would like to try on, like these different t-shirts on the right hand side from some shop website. And you want to use a generative model to see what your picture would look like if you put on one of these shirts on the right instead of whatever outfit you're currently wearing. Um, so this has commercial possibilities, of course, as evidenced by the fact that this is a startup. They've gotten funding, they have clients, et cetera. Um, so it, it's a popular technology. Um, I'm interested in it, you know, in a totally non-commercial way just because it's a fun research problem. Okay, so I'll talk about a couple of IU's projects. One um, from from a couple of years ago, which of course is already completely outdated, is outfit try-on uh, that we call dressing in order. And the second one, which already uses diffusion models, is all about in the wild try-on. And I will explain what all of these things are. Okay, so the first project, we called it dressing in order, or DOOR for short, because of course you have to have a clever acronym, you know, if you're in the space, ideally fashion related. Um, so this was a generator, GAN based at the time, which would put on garments recurrently one at a time on a person, that's why it's called dressing in order, and based on the order in which you can put on the garments, you would get different effects. For example, if you put on a shirt and then shorts, the shirt ends up being tucked in, and if you put on shorts and then a shirt, the shirt would end up not tucked in. Um, so this is the kind of thing which is still fairly hard to achieve with virtual try-on models, uh, ha is having different ways to put on multiple garments and style these garments um, is not very common. What is the most common till now, um, and these are the methods that work the best, are methods for transferring just a uh, garment from a single category. In particular, transferring a top like um, we have the top here in the middle. It's from what's called a ghost mannequin image. Uh, so it's clean, you know, there is no distracting background or anything like that. And you want to put it on, um, on a target person. And their existing methods, they can train basically from pairs that look like the middle image and the right hand image. So you see the shop garment by itself and you see the garment being worn by a person. And if you see this kind of paired data, you can basically train a warping module. This is what a lot of these models are based on. Some form of trained warping that just takes the source garment and somehow warps it onto the target person. Ideally you have a reference image of the person in that pose and you can try to match the reference image. Um, so if you have that kind of data and enough of it, you can train reasonably high quality models for it. But we wanted to go beyond it and we wanted to be able to try on multiple garments. 
Um, at the time, there was also applicable work when I just started looking at this. Uh, there was a method called ADGAN for attribute decomposed GAN in CVPR 2020 um, that basically could take multiple garments um, and sort of extract style codes and code these garments and then put these style codes onto a target person so that you could mix and match garments however you wanted. Um, however, that method had some limitations. For example, their style codes were just one dimensional so they would lose too much information. So if you try to take the source garment here on the left with some pattern um, and then encode it to this one dimensional code and then decode it to put it on the target person, you can see that the pattern gets destroyed. So we wanted to fix these kind of limitations. Um, and you know, they also had no ability to style garments in different ways like tacking in, not tacking in, or layering garments, etc. So these were all improvements um, that we wanted to achieve. And we were also building on top of so-called post-transfer methods. In general, virtual try-on methods have a lot in common with post-transfer methods. So this is where you have post-conditioned generation. Um, you can either condition on 2D pose, like stick figures shown here, or you can condition on more elaborate 3D pose that I will show later, what's called dense pose, when you actually have an estimate of how to map a person from an image onto a standard 3D person model. Um, so in this work, we were just conditioning on 2D stick figure poses because that's much simpler and more lightweight. And um, pose transfer methods, essentially, they take in one pose for the source person and a pose for the target person, and they want to render a person in the same garment but in a different pose. And you can train these methods also with data sets of people wearing the same clothes but in multiple poses. So once again, a big part of this pose transfer is to learn a warping from one pose to another. Um, and we incorporated a warping component into our method uh, to get the flow to be able to change poses. Okay, so these were all the ingredients that we were working with, and this is an outline of the system that we came up with. So the most interesting aspect of this, as I was mentioning, the sort of one that was the most novel at the time is having a recurrent architecture. Um, so this G pathway in the middle, this is the generator that sort of updates a latent representation of a person and it's recurrent. So every time in each step of this generator you can inject a garment, these are garments from the top that get encoded um, these E's are encoders and they encode the pattern in a 2D fashion so that the pattern gets decently preserved. So you basically, you can take these source garments from different people in different poses um, and we have a target pose and we have a flow component borrowed from some pose transfer literature that will warp all the source garments to the target pose and we encode all the garments, we encode the shape and texture separately, and then we can generate recurrently by inputting one garment at a time. So you, you, know, you can see basically, actually we treat hair uh, for technical reasons as the first garment, and you can see that as we add garments like this white shirt, then shorts, then maybe another t-shirt that can get layered on top of the long sleeve shirt, and maybe even a denim jacket, that can get layered on top um, of everything else. Um, so in principle, we can put on any number of garments um, just by running this generator recurrently. So that's the architecture. Um, you know, in practice, finding the right mix of losses and proxy tasks to train it is one of the important things in um, you know, any kind of work like this. So we took some time to figure out the right mix of things. It turned out, well, a big part of it is basically being able to reconstruct people using post-transfer or training on um, deep fashion data set that has people wearing the same clothes but in multiple poses so that you could take clothes from 
the same person in one pose, but then warp and put them on the person in a different pose and see if you can reconstruct the reference person. So that's an important part of the training. And another part of the training that probably is responsible for all of the stacking in behavior is basically in painting. Um, we scribble out some portion of the image and we try to recover the rest of the person. That really helps with the layering and putting the garments on top of each other, or if you're trying to warp the garments together and they don't quite match up right, um, it's the in-painting that happens to kind of fix up all the holes. Okay, so then it's pose condition, so you can see if you change the target pose and don't change anything else, um, you essentially get pose transfer, which was nice because we can evaluate on pose transfer. Reference images are, are available, so we can evaluate against the ground truth, and that's always good. Um, so this is how the layering works. So for instance, as I said before, if you put on a shirt and then you put on uh, the bottoms, you end up with a tucked in shirt. But you can switch the order of the garments and then you end up with a shirt that's not tucked in. So here they are displayed side by side to highlight the difference. So just changing the order uh, gives rise to these behaviors, which is pretty intuitive. Because we were encoding shape and texture separately, we can do fun things like mixing and matching basically patterns and shapes. So we can take a pattern, let's say from a t-shirt with sleeves, but then we can take the shape from a sleeveless shirt and put them together and you get this V-shaped garment on the right. We can also just transfer the texture. We can take a texture from a different image, not even necessarily a clothing image, and we can change the texture in the garment. Um, we can also, because we have this in-painting component, we can basically mask out parts of clothing, um, and with in-painting we can remove a pattern, um, or we can insert some additional pattern as basically sort of a pseudo garment and it ends up being a new print that gets superimposed. So because of the structure of our generator, we could get a lot of these editing capabilities essentially for free. So we had evaluations, of course. Um, a lot of it had to be down to user studies because virtual try and you're generating images for which you have no reference. So you kind of have to ask people how these images compare from different methods. But even for post transfer, we happen to do user study. So for post transfer, we basically were comparable, maybe a little bit better to the other methods um, because our post transfer component was pretty similar, but that was not the main focus. For virtual try and as you can see, the main method AD again that we were trying to improve, um, we did manage to improve the ability to capture the garment pattern um, and have fewer artifacts, so we were preferred by like 80%. So um, here's a few examples. So with things like texture transfer, um, of course, it does not look too realistic because this is all completely 2D. So you can especially see the striped pattern on the bottom left. Um, you can see that the pattern does not actually get warped in a realistic way from 2D to 3D. Um, and you know, one of the limitations of this data set and this model is that the images are fairly low resolution. So maybe at this low resolution it looks kind of okay, but it's obviously not realistic. So it, you know, it does not go super far. Um, and there were other problems, of course, with this kind of thing. You can look for artifacts and you can find them in many cases. As with any model trained from data, if you have a garment that is unusual and not well represented in the data, you're not gonna get a good, um, not gonna do a good job on it. For example, this unusual top um, in the top left, um, you know, it does not get rendered correctly because we did not see examples like that. 
Um, complicated poses were also hard to render because the model just did not see enough examples. It was trained on the deep fashion data set, which I think has maybe tens of thousands of examples. So especially if you have poses um, that are complicated, like limbs that are crossing, like legs crossing or arms crossing in front of the body, a lot of the times the generator would mess those up. And, you know, of course, you could say overall the domain of applicability of this method is pretty limited because the, you know, data set has clean backgrounds. It has models that all have the same body type. They're all pretty skinny. They're young. Um, they're mostly women. So, of course, um, you know, this model would not do it all well on out of data set people. Okay, so this was Dior in 2021. Um, any quick questions on that? Okay, so let me move on because of course things move very fast in this space. Um, by the time that IU was revisiting this you know, problem a couple of years later, of course everything is totally different. Diffusion models are now starting to be used more and more. Um, you know, just like every other generative application, diffusion models are starting to take over virtual try-on. Um, so what our new focus was in this project was to expand the domain of applicability of virtual try-on um, to basically go beyond clean studio images. So with diffusion models, diffusion models, you know, can uh, render amazing quality of images. So if you can harness it the right way, you can transfer it into whatever application that you want. So not surprisingly, high quality methods already exist with diffusion models for virtual try-on. Like there's this method called try-on diffusion from Google. Um, it was published in last year's CVPR. It has a custom diffusion architecture, so it's not just an off-the-shelf diffusion model. Um, and it's trained on a proprietary data set of millions of images. And this is paired data. So the same person wearing the same garment, but in different poses. They did try to get a wider variety of body types. So I think uh, with a larger amount of data, they did manage to expand um, the applicability of the methods in some way to be able to handle not just you know, thin model bodies, but more realistic bodies as well. But in another way, this method is just as limited as the ones that existed maybe three, four years ago. So it's still trained on clean uh, studio images with blank backgrounds, and it's still only on tops. Okay. Um, so, you know, in general, for the best kinds of results, including methods, you know, like the one behind the startup I was mentioning, they all have to acquire data in this controlled studio setting. They have to have their ghost mannequin, you know, garment images. They take pictures of a model with controlled lighting, you know, uh, on a controlled background. And if you collect enough of that kind of data, you can get good quality results. Um, and once again, what enables it is training to warp from the garment image to the human target image um, by reconstruction. If you have a, an image of the garment and if you have an image of the model wearing the garment, you use the knowledge of the model pose to learn to warp the garment to the model um, to come close to the reference image and you can do a pretty good job with that. So this is kind of the key behind the highest quality existing work. However, what IU was really interested in was trying to push virtual try to more realistic scenarios. Um, so these are example images, especially the ones on the left to show what I'm talking about. Um, pictures more like just casual pictures that people take of themselves and their friends, you know, maybe selfies, you take a picture of yourself in the mirror or whatever, um, you know, so you have realistic backgrounds, the poses are not as controlled, you know, the cropping is sort of more wild, uh, the lighting can be very bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is a scenario that we call street try-on. So you want to take a picture like this, 
and you want to take a garment maybe also from another picture like this and transfer it to a street picture of you. Much harder to train. Um, and paired data basically cannot be obtained for this scenario. Um, so we collected a smallish data set from an existing data set called Deep Fashion 2. So these are the kinds of images that are there, but some of them are just too hard, where you, you know, like some of the ones on the right, where you can't see most of the person, you have strong occlusions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we used a bunch of criteria to reject images that are already too unusable and to focus on the ones where you can see most of the body um, and its reasonable quality image. And we got about 12K training images and 2K test images for this street try-on setup. Clearly not enough to train a diffusion model from scratch, uh, but maybe enough to adapt existing components to have a method that works. Okay, so, um, so the first question, and of course this was a question that comes from reviewers because we submitted this to CVPR and you know, cranky reviewers asked us, well, you know, virtual try on, it should work very well by now, so what if you take one of the existing methods and just use it, does it work? We did not do it in the CVPR submission, so this was <laughs> something we had to do after the CVPR submission to prove that it does not in fact work. So here is an existing method. Um, we try to transfer this garment, which is still from a clean shop image, to a you know street image. So with a complicated background and everything, uh, just use it off the shelf. Does it work? <clears throat> the answer is no. And we trained several of them, and none of them really work. Um, but then, of course, the viewers also said, "Oh, but is it just a question of the background?" Um, you know, maybe those methods are just confused about the background, but we have very good segmentation methods these days, so can you just segment out the background, use one of those off-the-shelf methods, problem solved. So this was also a baseline that we had to run after CPR reviews. Um, so here is what it shows. So let's try a couple of examples. We have a couple of garments from street images and a couple of people, and we wanna transfer the garment to the person on the right. So let's say we first segment the person from the background, and we also need to do background in painting to fill in the holes because um, the outline of the person, of course, will change. Um, so we fill the hole in the background um, then we do try on in the foreground with an existing method, and this is the result, and you composite. So once again, you can see there are many artifacts. Uh, so it's not just background versus foreground, it's also just the type of image. These images are too different from studio images in terms of their distributions of poses and so on. Um, and this is our method that gives much cleaner results. So what is our method? So <clears throat> our method is based on learning solely from unpaired data, just a pile of street images that look like this. No assumption that we have multiple images of a person wearing the same outfit but in different poses or matched shop images and people wearing those same garments, just a pile of people wearing stuff against natural backgrounds. Um, so the way that we train the model is by relying on a lot of powerful pre-existing components and by basically trying to recompose these images and training with reconstruction. So we do pose estimation, outfit segmentation, and so on, um, and we use some tricks to kind of perturb uh, the input garment, um, and then we try to reconstruct. So I will show um, the pipeline of the method in a moment, but basically the components that we're using now, they include dense pose estimation. So this is more elaborate human pose estimation, not just 2D stick figure, but mapping the person onto a 3D parametric model. Um, we are using, of course, diffusion models in a couple of ways. We're using them for in-painting to fill in holes in the background and so on. Um, and we're using control net, uh, which is a way to control diffusion models by specifying certain things that we want, like we want this 
person pose, maybe we want this garment segmentation and we generate conditions on this. So by putting all of these components together, we can do a decent job on street try-on. Uh, so some of these components are adapted, like control net, you can retrain a control net maybe with tens of thousands of examples or thousands of examples, uh, but none of them are trained from scratch and the diffusion models are not custom diffusion models, they are just um, normal diffusion model in painters and control nets. Okay, so our pipeline is we have um, a garment input um, for example, on a person, um, and we extract dense pose, so this little picture shows what a dense pose estimate looks like. So it sort of gives you a dense estimate of where the person pixels are, and these colors are actually a mapping to a parametric 3D person model. So it's a dense coordinate mapping to a 3D model. And we do the same thing and get the same for the target person. So we went, want to take the garment from the top person and put it on the bottom person. Okay, <clears throat> so once we got the dense pose from the target person, we can just purely use the dense pose registration. You know, both of these people have been mapped onto the same 3D model. They have been registered in the same 3D coordinate system. So we can do the same with the garment. We can take the garment, map it onto the 3D model, um, and then map it down to the target person. And this is what the result looks like if you use purely dense pose registration. So no training here at all, just relying on this pre-learned dense pose. Um, as you can see, of course, it's far from perfect. It has a lot of holes, a lot of occlusions, as you would expect when you're transferring the pose. Um, and also errors due to dense pose not being fully accurate. So clearly you cannot um, kind of uh, use it as is, but it's a starting point. We <clears throat> also have another component that predicts the target garment segmentation. Um, you know, it's sort of a dense prediction model that happens to be similar to a style again, but I will skip the details. So we basically know which garment we wanna put on and we predict the shape of the garment. So this green mask is the shape or the outline of the garment that we want on the person. Um, and then we have a trained component that takes these things, it takes the den dense pose, it has the initial warped garment that has the errors and the occlusions, and it has the desired segmentation mask and it refines this warp. So it uh, basically fills in the holes, it fills in this outline and gives us a better picture of the garment, what it should look like on the target person. Um, next, we need to remove the source garment from the person that we no longer want to render. Existing methods, they um, have various ways of doing that. You can just, you know, and garment segmentation, um, so pre-trained semantic segmentation, it also underlies all of this. So you can either just segment the existing garment and mask it out, or some works use a rectangle or something like that. But then once again, you need to fill in basically the blank areas. And this is especially important if you basically, uh, let's say person is originally wearing a longer dress or long sleeves and the garment you wanna try on is shorter or has shorter sleeves. So if you need to expose skin, you basically need to reconstruct the limbs or in-paint the skin that you didn't see originally. Um, and this is an area of trouble for a lot of methods. They don't do a good job filling that in. So here we um, take advantage of diffusion models that can draw really good pictures of everything, including people. And this is a control net conditioned on pose that essentially tries to render the, pers the person without the garment um, with you know, as much skin as possible. So roughly speaking, we are undressing the person, but you know, we cannot fully undress them. Um, um, so basically it sort of shows us a person wearing minimal garments in the target pose. So this is um, the person on top of which we then want to put on the target garment and all we have to do is composite them. Of course, there are still going to be some artifacts when we do that. Um, 
especially around the edges. So we sort of leave a margin around the edges of the garment. We composite it on top of the person. And then there's a final diffusion and painting step that sort of fixes up the outlines and fills in the remaining areas. So that's basically the pipeline. Um, from a technical point of view, to me, the most interesting is basically this component that fixes the dense pose warping and training it from unpaired data. So this is the dense pose warping. Um, so as I mentioned, you have a registration of the garment and the human to the same 3D model. But if you just transferred pixels via this 3D model, you get a lot of issues. So we train a warping correction module, and the way that we train it um, is by simulating misregistrations using single images. So we take a source person, and we take the source person's dense pose, and we just perturb it using a special kind of noise. I found that there's a certain cosine noise um, that basically, you know, you could think of it as perturbing sort of the color values in this dense pose image in a certain way that would shift the coordinates in this dense pose atlas in a way that realistically mimics the kind of misalignment that you would get for transferring um, or trying to register two different people. So you can see on the right hand side we have um, a person from source pose and perturbed source pose and in the UV space, in the coordinate space, you can see how their different body parts match up with the synthetic perturbation. And this is pretty much what you see when you try to register two different people. So it's a fairly realistic misregistration pattern. So we can use it basically a synthetic perturbation to generate this synthetic training data. You can see this warped person over here that has kind of a messed up looking garment. And we can train a warping module to take this messed up garment and make it look again like the original. So this is um, the trained module that con corrects the warping. And everything else is done with uh, control nets that are fine tuned using relatively small number of images. Okay, so um, this is our street try on pipeline. So you can see some results. Um, you know, these are some successful results. You can even see some where, for example, we're going from sleeves uh, to no sleeves or we're going from longer dresses to shorter dresses. This is really something that a lot of existing methods struggle with. Uh, here are some more results for tops. Um, once again, no existing pre-trained methods for which we could actually, or even you know, we retrained some of them for which we could get the implementation. There are some that are proprietary, like this Google you know, try on diffusion and so on. We could not compare with them, but we compared to a bunch um, and none of them can do as good of a job. Um, we also did some evaluations with FID and on this kind of street setup with complicated backgrounds and so on, um, we really do the best. Okay, um, of course, it's still far from perfect. Um, so here are some areas of trouble. So in particular, when you have things occluding the garment, like uh, this person in the top left is holding a camera in front of the shirt, that sort of gets parsed as being part of the shirts and transferred onto the target person. Um, sometimes the warping just gets completely screwed up. Um, the preservation of patterns is still not perfect. Um, especially when you're trying to warp a pattern from one view to the other, this is also one of the most challenging areas for um, any kind of try-on methods. You know, so our diffusion model, um, you know, can screw things up. Um, we don't do anything to correct the lighting. So if you have a very large lighting mismatch between the two people, um, we don't change the lighting so it gets reflected. The bottom one is sort of supposed to show mismatched in lighting, um, although it's not as obvious as I would like. For studio try on, this is not as much of a problem because studio lighting is pretty even and pretty consistent. But with street try on, when you can have strong sunlight or indoor lighting or whatever, strong shadows, you can see it a lot more. So these are sort of the limitations. So now let me move on. 
Um, so we've, both of these works of philosophy has been tried to create relatively lightweight methods, at least in terms of uh, from scratch training requirements. They're not necessarily that lightweight in terms of computation um, to uh, broaden the applicability of try-on methods. Okay, so now let me um, move on to the work of my other PhD student, Viraj Shah, um, who has also been working on adapting diffusion models, but for other applications. So this is a collaboration with Google. He did it while on an internship at Google. So what he is trying to do here is what's called recontextualization. So that's a fairly new term, at least to me. Um, Basically, what he used to work on before, and you know, some of the work we've done before in my group, is stylization. Um, so stylization would be example-based stylization, where let's say you have a picture of a realistic face, and you have some style references, like some face in watercolor style, or some anime face, or some face in you know, some pen and ink style, or whatever. You want to render your own face in all of these artistic styles. This is example-based stylization. And um, Viraj had a nice work a couple of years ago that he called multi-style Gian, trying to do single example based stylization with a style again for faces. It might still be the state of the art for face stylization, but nobody cares about style again anymore, so we've got to move with the times. Okay, so now with diffusion models, people are interested in exemplar based stylization, um, but because diffusion models are so powerful, you don't only stylize, you can recontextualize. So it means you can render the same subject, but in different ways, like maybe in a different pose with a different background, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all done by specifying a text prompt that tells you how you want this content to be depicted. So the starting point for this work is what's called Dream Booth. Um, this was a paper from Google. Um, how many of you have heard of Dream Booth? Yeah, so it was pretty well known. I think it might have even gotten the best paper award at CVPR. Yeah. Ah, okay, really cool. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know everyone who's involved, but some of them are also Viraj's mentors on his new project and so on. Um, so the idea, you know, the dream booth was essentially a diffusion model can draw anything, but it doesn't necessarily know how to draw some very specific thing like my dog. So this little dot here represents my dog, which is maybe just outside of space of the kind of things that the diffusion model normally draws. So you can fine tune it without too much trouble to recontextualize your dog. So it can draw your dog in the Acropolis or in a dog house or in a bucket or whatever. So now um, Viraj wanted to um, combine this kind of recontextualization with, um, with stylization. So in practice, the way that Dream Booth is fine-tuned, or in general, how these huge diffusion models are fine-tuned is with something called low-rank adaptation, or LoRa. It's basically where you have, um, in, you have some pre-trained weights, and you just learn a product of low-rank matrices to add to these weights to update the weights. So this is just a very efficient way to fine-tune things. Um, so can you learn a style? That was sort of Viraj's first question. Can you learn a style or example-based stylization using Dream Booth? Is it just a special case of what it can do? Um, well, you know, first he looked at it with Stable Diffusion 1.5, and basically you have the statue in the lower left hand. Um, like matte black sculpture, and can you draw arbitrary content in this matte black sculpture style? So uh, here on the top, uh, sorry, on the bottom right are attempts to draw a cat in this matte black sculpture style, old lady, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not quite working. So maybe it can't do stylization. But great news, SDXL came out. So let's try it with SDXL. And now with SDXL, it magically works. So we have, you know, we have a research direction. This is one of those things that happens all the time and that frustrates me to no end. 
Um, why is it not working as an SD 1.5 and working on SDXL? We have no clue, but since it's working, let's do something with it. Okay, so, so you can see this is so far just Dream Booth on SDXL. Nothing new here, just you know, grabbing SDXL and using Dream Booth on it. You can see it can capture different subjects specified by text prompts in a style like this style reference on the left, like cartoon drawing. It can draw a bicycle in that style, a bird, a hat, a piano, etc. cetera. A uh, couple more examples, so proving it works. So now, here is where our research comes in. Can we merge content and style? So we have this dog, and we use Dream Booth on it, and we have this Laura um, that can draw these update matrices that can draw this dog in different contexts. So that's our content. Um, and now let's have a style example, like flowers in this watercolor painting style. And we have another Laura that can draw different content in this watercolor style. So we've got the content Laura and the style Laura. How do we merge them if we want to combine con con um, recontextualization of stylization. So obviously the first thing to do is just to try to add these LoRa update matrices. Turns out it doesn't quite work. Okay, well maybe it's good that it doesn't quite work because that would be too simple. Um, so then Viraj started looking at the properties of LoRa weights. So what can we do? Why is it not working and what can we do to make it work? Well, the first property is that the weights are very sparse. These are uh, sort of histogram of weight, LoRa weight magnitudes. Most of them are clustered around zero. So it turns out you can just zero out, you know, like 80% of the weights or something like that, and visually the result looks more or less the same. Even zero out 90% of the weight, it still looks okay. So most of these LoRa weights don't matter. Um, so it means that we can potentially basically zero out or downweight a lot of columns and we'll still be okay. The other thing that he found, if, if you compare these LoRa weights column wise, um, bad things happen when you try to add columns that have high cosine similarity. So these plots show in blue when you do direct merger just adding the two LoRa's, um, the cosine similarities that you get for the columns. So they're pretty high um, and you don't get a good result. A good result. So he thought, well, what if we, when we merge, we try to encourage the cosine similarity to be low, can we get better results? And it turns out that we can. So this is his method that he calls zip LoRa. So the idea is you try to learn coefficients, so you have your LoRa update matrices that you don't change, but you learn additional coefficients for each column of these matrices with which to merge them. So these um, M sub C's and M sub S's are the column coefficients that you're learning as you're merging. Um, and then you have this weighted combination. So first of all, uh, well, how do we learn these M's? What should the loss be? Well, first of all, the loss should be that when we just try to draw the content, our images should be the same. We should reproduce the old content images with this merged LoRa. So there is a um, reconstruction loss component where basically um, says that we try to come close to uh, with the merged LoRa come close to the content and also only the style images of the old LoRa. So we try to preserve the behavior in terms of image reconstruction of the individual LoRa's. And the second component of the loss is encouraging um, a low cosine similarity. So basically minimize the cosine similarity between these um, weight vectors that we're learning, which encourages low cosine similarity of the um, LoRa matrices, and combine those two losses, reconstruction with the low cosine similarity, and we get good results. So now this is the merging method, uh, fairly lightweight, and you can see you can stylize the dog in style of watercolor painting and still recontextualize it with different text prompts and so on. 
So here are a few more examples with different subjects and different styles. Um, though works pretty well. So Viraj compared to a bunch of methods. Of course, I already said it works better than direct merging or direct addition. Um, joint training is pretty slow. Um, there are already probably something like three or four methods that can roughly do something similar, so he had to compare to them. And once again, um, our results are better. Um, he did a bunch of user studies comparing to multiple methods, and you can see that the Ziplora is preferred by users um, by you know decent margins over competing methods. You know, also like everything else, doesn't work perfectly. Um, as with any example-based stylization, there is always some ambiguity about exactly what the style is from the example. So here you, you can see a cliff in watercolor painting style. Um, so when you try to capture the style, basically the diffusion model ends up learning essentially the content as part of the style. This cliff um, ends up always being reproduced in the background. So this is the most common failure mode where the style LoRa doesn't quite capture what you want it to capture, but also get some of the content. Um, so very simple method, you know, how long it will survive, how far it will go, I don't know. As I said, there's already like three or four similar looking methods. Uh, but Viraj is interested in trying to see can you combine more than two LoRa's. Would be even nicer if you could do it without additional tuning, like we were still training these column-wise coefficients for merging. Um, and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's relatively simple, gets decent results. So this is what I wanted to cover. Um, any questions on any of this? Yeah? Uh, he probably does. Unfortunately, I <laughs> am not familiar enough with the details uh, of the models to kind of really know what could be responsible. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, because maybe in a certain sense, but also it kind of means that there is a lot of wiggle room. You can sort of still mess up these update matrices to a great extent, and it will still work, at least for this application. Um, so I think he did not have a very solid mathematical justification. I think it was more the intuition. Um, there's a lot of wiggle room. We can like ignore most of these columns or downweight them and probably will still be okay. So let's try to change them in a way that will fix the biggest failure and still if it, uh, and see if it will still go through and it seems to. Yeah. Um, it's probably possible to replace UNET with transformers, but you never know what you're gonna get because this does seem, and I, don't, I also don't know about the underlying change between SD 1.5 and SDXL because these things, uh, the you know, underlying backbone seems to be changing all the time. Um, so I guess <laughs> you always have to try it on the exact backbone model that you want to run it on and see if it will work or not. That kind of seems to be the philosophy. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, should the dense pose be separated for female and male? Um, possibly. 
I think right now we don't have enough data and it sort of works well enough right now, at least with the kind of examples that we've shown. If you're trying to transfer relatively shapeless garments like t-shirts, it's okay. If you were trying to you know, transfer more tailored garments, probably it would be less okay. So it's basically what you can get away with given the data you have. And I think this is also a big difference between like a real commercial application of virtual try-on versus uh, just doing cute pictures you know, for an academic audience. I think if you're a startup uh, for virtual try-on, you really care much more or should care much more about getting things right because a person wants to know what will this garment actually look like on their body in order to buy it, not just produce a plausible looking picture, but you know, person wants to know is it gonna fit me right. So I think you should not be able to get away with that kind of thing. But still in virtual try on, um, you know, it's still not possible to get an accurate 3D model of a, you know, of a customer's body for virtual try on. So it's still, I think pictures are transferred um, you know, to studio models and so on and so forth. So I think for them, they have to look at the costs. Do they want to pay? Is it important enough for them to collect uh, data separately for men and women? And maybe it does make sense. So I don't know. Yeah. So today's post, you um, added noise. Can you explain that a little bit more? Like, is there a mechanism noise in the type Well, so the details are in the preprint. Um, but the idea is you basically, you know, displace the coordinates. You know, you map a person from 2D to the 3D dense pose, but then you displace the coordinates to mimic what would happen if you had another viewpoint of that person and you were trying to also map them onto that 3D model to get registration errors. So IU basically kind of just looked at what these look like and she came up with this cosine noise model to um, produce errors that she thought, uh, you know, looked realistic enough. Yeah, the details are in the archive paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the pres how does the in painting preserve what? The pose? Oh, posture? Um, well, it's a control net conditioned on the pose. So to the extent that the dense pose was an accurate estimate for that person, um, it, it does okay. Yeah? Um, well, so to get a 3D reconstruction of the garment, I think there are methods that kind of go in that direction. But of course, the hole filling problems, you know, would be very severe. Um, I think there are methods that basically already take almost more of a graphics flavor and use differentiable rendering and everything um, and hole filling on the texture map to try to do something like that. So I think there is literature that tries to do some of it, but it's pretty challenging. So I think we still try to sort of use it minimally for what we need to, to go from one pose to another. And you know, the more occlusion and disocclusion you have, uh, the worse the results are going to be in general. Yeah. Um, lighting would be pretty challenging. We sort of talked about it as an open research problem. So there is work aimed at relighting in general. Um, there is no work that I know of for relighting specifically for this like virtual try on domain or relighting of people. Um, you do need to have some data or some sort of fairly elaborate models for it to work. You need to do some kind of decomposition, like intrinsic image decomposition. 
you know, maybe do some estimate of the shading, et cetera, et cetera, or have a good generative model that can, you know, mimic things like changing the lighting. So it's a whole research direction. Um, you know, in David Forsyth's group, for example, they, they have work um, going in that direction. But it tends to be much more right now the work on either on very simple synthetic data sets or just sort of frontal faces. Um, or images of rooms. There's a lot of relighting happening in images of rooms. I have not seen so much relighting for images of people. Yeah. Well, dense pose basically is the mapping onto a simple mesh. We just do kind of the bare minimum with it. As I mentioned, there are methods that try to do a lot more. They actually try to um, sort of hole fill the texture map so that you could re-render that mesh from different point of view and they use differentiable rendering. Um, so we did not do that, but there is work like that. Hmm? Ah, okay. I almost gave up. Well, okay, so the talk is officially over, um, but I did have a rant, so. If anybody, anybody interested in a rant? Uh, okay, since they gave me half an hour before lunch, if, uh, feel free to leave at any time. Okay, so this is my rant that I've been sort of trying out in front of very select audiences. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so back to my theme of me being an obsolete old person. <laughs> um, so this is a kind of, um, and you know, I, I used to read Dr. Seuss books to my daughter and so on. So this is what computer vision in a sense, you know, maybe nostalgically I wanna say looked like 20 years ago um, or longer ago. We were just sort of frolicking in this magical land of unsolved problems that were all way too hard for us to figure out. We didn't even know how to begin to approach them. Like object recognition, that was always sort of the holy grail of well, how do we do object recognition? We have no clue, our methods are so bad. Clearly it will be decades before it's solved. So on that level, things were a little frustrating because nothing worked. All of our methods were complete garbage. Uh, but on another level, it was great because you could do anything you wanted and nobody could tell you, oh, this is not potentially a reasonable thing to do. Um, you know, but these days computer vision feels a lot more like this. You know, everything has been scaled up and, um, you know, put on an industrial footing. We're harvesting data, we're sweeping it into these giant neural networks, we're crunching the neural networks and outcome methods that work very well, um, you know. So uh, on one level it's great because things actually work, but on another level it just kind of doesn't feel as nice. So I find myself wondering more and more what's going to happen to academics in this landscape. Are we gonna be like these, you know, barbalutes that are going to have to go away because they have to find food? Uh, or, I don't know. You know, so this is kind of, my target audience, I guess, are academics, uh, people who, you know, think of themselves as pure academics or more on the academic side, or, you know, maybe some of you who want to considering joining academia and doing this kind of research. Um, you know, for people in industry, I think things are a lot more straightforward. Companies have things that they want to do to make money. You help them make money, everything's fine. But what are academics supposed to be doing when a lot of the things have been scaled up out of our reach taken over by industry is much less clear to me. Um, but one of the things that I'm really becoming increasingly troubled by is the role that we as academics play. Maybe, you know, uh, especially in the early days, we did it very willingly and gleefully, but now I feel like it's becoming very destructive. Um, basically, 
you know, I'm talking about the increasing growth of publications. I think there is actually very bad tendency to overpublish these days. Um, and you can see kind of how the number of submissions to CVPR keeps going up over time. Uh, and this does not even include this year. I think this year was over 11,000. So not only are we getting bigger, I see no sign that this curve is saturating. How we can handle this volume of submissions is unclear to me. And I was a program chair of CVPR 23, so I have firsthand knowledge basically of how the sausage is made. Uh, I don't think peer review is sustainable at this scale. And I think also the pace of work is so fast that, you know, I think honestly, for those of you who are PhD students, who, are, who is a PhD student here? Okay. Uh, it, uh, to me, it looks like it's very, very hard because um, basically, you know, I used to think for the students that I would advise that a couple of years was a good amount of time to spend on a problem. You know, maybe it takes you a year to get up to speed, to put together a decent system, do your experiments and have a submission. If you can do it in a year as a PhD student, I'm very happy with you. But then of course, you know, the submission might not get in, it might not quite be there, or you might find, well, you need to do additional experiments to satisfy reviewers, so you resubmit, you do some improvements. Um, you know, maybe after a year and a half, you know, it's in better state, you submit again, and then hopefully it gets in, you get a very nice piece of work you can be proud of. Um, but these days, this kind of model doesn't work anymore. I think, you know, the cycle time is so fast Realistically, if you want to publish in CVPR, you need to throw something together basically um, in like three, four months. Between an ICCV cycle and the CVPR cycle, you need to pick up something that is very recent, do something with it, and submit it to the next conference. Because if you don't get it in, you will be scooped. There will be like three, four papers doing roughly the same thing. So if you don't get in because of bad reviews, and you know this has always happened, um, I'm not going to pretend you know that the system was perfect in the olden days. Bad reviews have always happened. We've always had uninformed reviewers or reviewers with crazy opinions or whatever. But at least it used to be the case, okay, you had bad luck with the reviewers, resubmit it. If your work is really good, probably you will have better luck. Not the case anymore. Most things don't have a shelf life that's long enough for that. If you have bad luck this cycle, you know, you will be lucky if your work is still relevant for the next cycle. Um, so more and more of the sort of mainstream computer work is of this flavor. So I think it's very, very hard to be a PhD student. And I think also people are realizing basically that the way that you play this publication game is you, you roll the dice. Because it's so noisy and it moves so fast, you want to have as many dice rolls as you can in a given cycle. So people collaborate. You know, partly it's out of necessity. Um, because a lot of the things that we can do now are bigger than just one PhD student working with an advisor because of resources, because of size of the project, we need to collaborate. But also people collaborate strategically. They realize I want to have my name on as many submissions as possible to have chances to have some papers on my CV. So people are playing this game more and more and this is kind of what's driving this curve, I think. And you know the peer review is buckling. We do not have a base of reviewers to review all these papers. You know how it is going to be kept up. I don't know, but I don't think it's healthy for academics to do research that way. You know, so we are responsible because, yeah. Okay. Well, this is my talk is over. This is my rant. Completely optional. Anybody else in this room? Okay. All right, yeah, so you know, we've been too in love basically with the academic credentials, with the papers on our CV, with the impact factor, with the citations, and we've kept this engine going, and I don't think this engine is going anywhere good. Um, so I don't have a good you know, uh, solution, but we're in a red queen race, and you know, we're running faster and faster just to stay in the same place, but I think we're kind of running ourselves over a cliff. Okay, rant over. But feel free to, you know, talk to me, you know, um, in the next few minutes if you have any reactions. <laughs>